Welcome to the Hyper Fast Show, where we believe unlimited growth in business and life is created by surrounding yourself with people who have been where you are going. Learning from others allows you to compress time and grow hyper fast. And now, here are your hosts, Kerry Shaw and Dan Lesniak. Kerry and Dan are real estate developers, best-selling authors, billion-dollar agents, and million-dollar agent makers. And now, get ready to grow hyper fast. Welcome. We are so excited to have you here at the Hyper Fast Agent Podcast. I'm with Andrew Greer. And Andrew, you are one of the top infill developers in San Diego. So my goal today in bringing you on the show is to have agents understand how to develop relationships with people like you. Because let's face it, you're not going to do one deal. If somebody's amazing, you're going to be doing a lot of deals together, right? Oh, oh yeah. That That's a key with a developer in building a relationship with a real estate team or agent is knowing that level of trust and process that they can go through and buy multiple transactions. Because we're always looking to plug and play our same formula totally. over and over again. Yeah. So you would be like a home run for an agent, right? I, I, I would think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's embarrassing. Yes. But yeah, maybe. yes. I would be their <laughs> ideal person. So if an agent's trying to build a relationship anywhere in the country with a developer, what are some things that they should know? Mm -hmm. So the most important thing to learn as an agent is if you're working within a farm, which most uh, agents are, and I am an agent as well, so I... And I you loosely, really, I don't, I don't like really market understand. for it. So I understand the idea of it is yep. um, you have your farm, you need to learn the zoning of your farm. So where are the high density zones? Where are the low density zones? What areas have been rezoned? And rezoning is the number one opportunity for a realtor to come in and bring something to an infill developer that can go out and turn into a big deal. Okay. So, um, First, money, money, money. Yeah, big time <laughs> money because it's it's taking an underutilized area that's been rezoned and bringing it to the table. And the best way to describe this, and this is how I describe it to agents when I meet with them here um, in office, is if you walk into a listing appointment and you're concerned that you're not going to be able to sell the home because there's apartments surrounding it. Mm-hmm. You need to call me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because that is one of the telltale signs of a rezone. Okay. Um, they've come in. It might have been an older neighborhood that was on the fringe of downtown, but now downtown's pushed its way out. Right. All the single family homes are going away. And there's those few straggler single family homes still in the area that are going to be torn down and then turned into apartment complexes like everything around them. Yep. So that is the number one sign for an agent when looking for it. Okay. The, the next, and I can only reiterate so much how important this is, cities come out with their city plan for that zoning. Okay. And they're gonna have areas that become hot zones. They're designed for like more development. You wanna go to these meetings and find out where do you want more development? What's the city's goal? Where do they want more urban housing? Where do they Mm -hmm. want more mixed use? Then target those areas based on those maps that you can get from your city. They'll gladly give them to agents. Yeah. And go out and prospect to them. Same kind of prospecting you're doing right now. I mean, we do a lot of uh, pre-foreclosure, foreclosure, uh, tax liens, uh, physical distress, go out. And a lot of times to a developer, we're going to be able to come in at a higher price than someone that was going to buy it at a single family rate Mm -hmm. and still make it work. Right. So then you're providing value to your seller. Yeah. And you're providing value to the developer, which they will kindly remember and often reward you for in the future, right? Yeah. And it's when you work with a developer who's doing build to sell, Um, it provides an opportunity for you to have a 12 to 18 month lead time on new housing that's coming. Yeah. So it allows you to not only bring a property to them, but have multiple properties to sell. If you can prove that you have a strategy that works for dispositioning those properties in the end. And we're always looking for out of the box ways to get an interest list built up. Because one of the things we like as developers is selling things. <laughs> yeah, it's knowing that you already have it taken oh, yeah. down. Mm-hmm. That gives you the ability to then go out and expand what you're doing. Exactly. Yep. Okay. 
Um, so going back to your first point, which was know the zoning, yeah. is there a strategy? Is it simply going to the city and studying that? How would you recommend an agent who's new that's watching this that's like, okay, that sounds like a great plan, but how do I do it? Yeah. What would your recommendation be? So the easiest way up front in any area, if it's not a major metropolitan area like San Diego, Los Angeles, uh, I'm sure out on the East Coast where you're at in DC and everything, they have it all online. They have it available for you. You can find it. You can look it up. Um, in other areas, the easiest first step to take is go down to what's going to be called your building services or your development services, mm -hmm. depending upon what city you're in. And you're going to see multiple counters. And this was the first time I walked in. I was like, <laughs> what is this? Where and, am I? Yeah, it's just your, there's facilities, engineering, planning, zoning, all these things that yep. are in there. You don't want to go to zoning, even though it's called zoning, to get the zoning information. You want to go to planning. Yep. So planning is the forward thinking process of what those zones are going to be. So a zoning counter is strictly... What are you building? It fits into the zone. Planning is this is what we want in the zone. They can guide you to either an online database. A lot of times, almost everyone I've been to has a huge map that's color coded that shows the different zoning. Yeah. And go in, have that conversation. And then if you're in a real niche neighborhood, like in San Diego, there's North Park, South Park, um, Park West, okay. all these little areas have special meetings once a month generally okay. for planning. And you can go in and sit down and actually meet the community planners in that area and develop relationships. And this is a good way to find out who's actually developing. you Because the developers are gonna be there. Yeah, so we're yeah. there. Uh, I presented them a lot of times. So if I have a project that is either controversial or requires community input, I'm gonna have to go and present there. Right. You go see who's presenting and you, you just add this to your schedule for once a month for a year or two. All of a sudden you're going to know all the big players. Yeah. And a lot of times you might meet the guy from our team who's going out for multiple developers and presenting because a lot of times that happens with our bigger projects. Sure. We pass them on to a consultant. That consultant's going to have access to 20 developers for you. Huge. And Absolutely yeah, huge. Yeah, that's someone to take to lunch. Yeah. Oh, uh, and... <laughs> Uh, take to lunch often. Yes. <laughs> Send lunch. Yeah. Do whatever you can <laughs> whatever do. Whatever you can. Yeah. There's, you'll find the the actual trigger pullers and the people that can make things happen if you go to those meetings and see what's going on. Okay. So I think just from my own experience working with developers, there's some pretty tragic mistakes agents make when they're trying to approach developers. Mm -hmm. So when you think about what you would suggest they not do, what are some examples of like just don't do this. A, a big don't do for me is don't, if you're talking to a homeowner and you haven't verified how many units can be built there and the homeowner tells you how many units can be built there, but you haven't gone through the process of researching it to give me a real answer, don't, don't waste my time. Don't expect it to be accurate. A lot of times, you can be directly across the street from a 10 unit complex and only be allowed to put a duplex on that lot. Right. So do the research, do the legwork, know the zoning. And another thing that this irks me and I, <laughs> I'm trying not to get upset because I like, <laughs> I love getting leads, but it drives me nuts when I say, nope, that can't be built there. And then it, becomes a sales pitch and I'm like no this is it's not a sale I'm, I'm being matter of fact with you if you'd like me to explain a little bit further why I'm okay doing that but don't tell me that it can be built <laughs> yeah I, we you, know yeah it's, then it just makes you look inexperienced and like you don't know what you're talking about um okay can I throw a pet peeve in there yeah because oh yeah. <laughs> it happens to me um and sometimes it's with agents in my market because they know I work with developers. They're gonna they bring opportunities to me, and they haven't vetted the numbers. Oh, it's yeah. like, oh, I have this great opportunity for a million dollars, and the outsell of the house is one five. It's like, 
it makes you look so unprofessional, guys. So you really have to understand how to perform a deal and how to look at, okay, what's the acquisition cost? Mm -hmm. What are all of the costs that the developer is going to incur? What's the carrying costs? How are they going to, the commission that they're going to have to pay, all of the development work that they're going to have to do, you have to come up with, and I'm going to ask you a question about this in a moment, for some rule of thumb numbers. It's different in each of your markets. So understand oh, yeah. that. If you're having to build when you're on the water or on a cliff or there's a site condition, that's going to dramatically change the performa, right? Massively. So you have to be really good at doing that research up front because when you bring a developer a deal and you tell them this is a fantastic deal and it's a shit deal, all of a sudden your credibility just goes tanks. So the next time when you do have a good opportunity, if you bring that deal back again, nobody's listening to you because at that point they've already written you off. Oh, yeah. Or they might not even take the meeting to have the conversation since the last time you really didn't know what you were doing. So don't rush this. Get good at the performa process so that you can provide credible information that's valuable and you don't waste people's time. Yeah. And as a listing side thing for agents listing developments, verify that your performa is correct. Yeah. We see the performers that come from agents and if all the numbers are wrong and then you call me in another lead later, we remember. It's, it's a small community. We remember... Yeah that your numbers projected this. And that's something that I've seen a lot of too. Yeah, absolutely. So what he's saying is you're inflating the outsell value. And then most of you believe that you can just be nice to the developer and over time they're going to reduce the price, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And so ultimately that really hurts your business because you wanted to get that deal done so badly, but it costs you your reputation with the developers in your industry. Yeah, and it's, it, even in San Diego, it's a small-knit group of developers. And we all know who's going to buy what. Yeah. So a lot of times, you can contact me on something, and I'll, you know that's not my style, but I actually know whose style it is, and it sounds good, so let me just connect you. Yeah, that's and awesome. That happens a lot because we there's a symbiotic relationship where I know that if something slides across their table and they heard that I passed this deal to them, they're going to slide it my way. Right. Because I'm notoriously known as not like an A or B neighborhood guy. Like I'm a C neighborhood guy. I okay. love C neighborhoods. So everyone knows if it's kind of a little hood, like send it my way. <laughs> <laughs> so the nicer stuff, I know who to send that to. <laughs> That's actually really smart. I don't think that in my experience, all developers are not like that. That's just you being very smart. Right, because why wouldn't you do that? Oh, yeah. that. It, but the other thing is, guys, if you had lost credibility with him, he would not do that. He wouldn't take the time to listen to the deal close enough to even know to pass it on. So how would you recommend, if they don't know how to do performance, if they don't really understand, what are the steps that they can take to get more familiar with the cost of, of construction in their area and all of the numbers? I have some thoughts about it, but... It's more from an agent perspective. So from a development perspective, when you're looking at some of this stuff and you're getting deals that you're like, this is laughable. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about how they can get better at that skill set? So I'm going to give you the not easy answer. Okay. And I'm going to give you the answer that I used myself when I wasn't developing so I could get into it. And um, I think it's really important and it's a long run thing. I've seen it work, so I believe in it. <laughs> okay. But it's get yourself. I I made a list of five guys I needed to know. That was my list, and I figured out how to get in front of all five of them in right on a regular basis. Where I wasn't there to meet them, but we were at the same events. We had contact, and I started going to things where I could connect with them on another level. So smart built up relationships, and then I was able to ask them to sit down. So, because and I, they already kind of knew who you were, you I were I was involved. around, I was involved in the community, I was trying to help them with their stuff in inadvertent ways, find ways to help them out, bring people to their open houses for developments, just be around constantly and get to the point where they saw that I was a fixture that wasn't gonna go away. Yeah, <laughs> makes total sense. Set up the meetings with them, and then I sat down and I asked them all the questions I had. And then I provided them as much value I could in any way that they were looking. 
Yeah. Some of it was marketing. Some of it was finding vendors for them. Some of it was just connecting them with some of my connections because I had built connections in the industry. Yeah. That set me up to find out what the numbers were for different guys in different areas. Absolutely. Then I could review the deals, look at them, and that allowed me the opportunity to go out and partner, network, and do deals with them. Now, as a realtor, the difference would be you now know their numbers, so you can go project deals to them, show them what it's going to look like, and know what they're looking for. Sure. Everyone in San Diego knows if something pops up in National City, you call me, I'm probably going to like it. Nice. If you have something in Encinitas and you call me, I'm probably going to ask why you called me. <laughs> it's, it's understanding where guys work, where guys focus. Yeah, and the lanes. Th yeah, that long run connecting and not saying, you know what, I want to watch this podcast and tomorrow I'm going to present a development deal. That's, you're just going to blow that credibility. Mm -hmm. You need to go out, build those relationships, really feed off of what's out there and be a giver in the situation to do that. And, I, and yeah. I'm still continually doing that. Every year I set up a list of five people minimum that I have to get in contact with and then I come up with a plan so smart. to get in front of them on a regular basis. You know, when we, when we interview a lot of entrepreneurs on here, one common theme is that they can compress time with relationships. Oh yeah. Right? And that's exactly what you're talking about. Like, you don't have to go out and do construction to understand the numbers if you work with the right people and develop the right relationships. That's brilliant. 100%. Um, on the agent side, one of the things that, that I've done I knew that in order to grow my business fast, and I don't know if you know this about me, but I developed a program where I came from a new home sales background. So I looked at agents around my market and I thought, wow, the agents that are willing to do the hard work and go get the land and sit in the family room with the sellers that have been there for 40 years and have tables that they don't want to get rid of and like stuff that you're like having the conversation and digging in deep with them, those agents don't have the skill set to do new construction often. It's very rare that you find an agent, what I noticed in my market, it's very rare that you find an agent that's versatile and can do both well. So the hustlers that are getting the land are falling down on the new construction sales process because they're not skilled enough. And the people who want the new construction listings are not willing to go sit in the family room with Betty and Jim for four hours to have tea to win the listing, mm -hmm. right? So I saw this interesting need in my market and I knew that I could sell any new construction really well because that was my background. And I sold buildings and I sold single family houses. So the construction knowledge wasn't the challenge for me. It was, okay, I need bait because I need the developers to want to work with me and they're mm -hmm. only going to find me valuable if I have what they want and that's the land. Yep. So how do I get in and find the land? So what I did in my market, guys, is just focused on where do the numbers make sense? So if you study, you can approach this equation from a lot of different places. If you study the comparables and you find out, okay, where is new construction selling? And what was the acquisition price of the land that, de that the developer paid? You have to remember time is moving forward and costs are changing, but it's going to give you a benchmark. And then once you understand that benchmark, you can start calling on some of those developers if you're getting access to land and saying, I noticed on 123 Main Street, your acquisition cost was X. Now I know pricing has changed, so help me understand your price per square foot. I do not want to waste your time, and I want to be able to present you really accurate performance. And you earn so much respect because oh, yeah. so many other agents are wasting their time, and you've taken the time to research their past projects to know where are they buying, what were their numbers, Right. And that just that shortcuts the amount of time that it takes, because you're, when you're calling them, they're like, whoa, who is this girl? Yeah. Right. So I was able to get the numbers just by having enough research. If I called somebody, if I called you out of the blue and I said, hey, what's your cost per square foot to build? I'd be like, <laughs> go pan sound. Sandy. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like another idiot. Where, what, what are you talking? Yeah. It's yeah. Like, I'm not going to tell you that. There's no reason. But when you approach it from, hey, I'm meeting with 10 to 15 sellers a month in the neighborhood that you're focused on, and I want to understand so I don't waste your time when to present you opportunity, 
can we get together for 15 minutes and just talk through that so I can run really accurate performance that are in the format that you want and, and create a lot of value and opportunity for you? People are like, okay. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it's what they need, right? So the other key, which I want to ask you how you would approach this if you're an agent, um, for me, with a lot of the builders, I demand exclusivity on the acquisition. I'm like, look, if I'm going to be searching for you in this neighborhood and I'm going to go after new construction, I'm going to have to do a lot of the dirty work in the neighborhoods. I'm going to have to spend a ton of money to get that. So I kind of, I chunk it off because he's not going to agree to work exclusively with me in all of San Diego. Like that does not make sense. Yeah. But if he knows I'm a hustler and I keep ha providing him opportunity and I want the outsell for the opportunity that I'm providing him and I actually execute on selling it, you're positioning yourself to be more valuable and you earn respect up front instead of just, oh, I hope you work with me. I like. Yeah, don't say you hope you work with them. No. You, you even just heard the way Carrie said it. said it. It sounded bad. It sounds awful. It's, and it's so such hesitation and like lack of confidence, right? And we need killers. That's our that's the thing. You need you you tell the developer that they that you're going to do that or you expect that the developer is going to tell you to pound sand. You have yeah, to I mean, you that's... have to present it though because ultimately if I give him a, if I'm a new agent and I give him a piece of land would he rather work with somebody that he knows to sell it? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. The fact is yes. But if I tell him I'm going to go hustle for you in this neighborhood I'm going to find these opportunities for you and I don't stop until I do and then I fulfill. All of a sudden, I've created the I've created the the pact that if I bring you something, I'm selling it. And these yeah. are the reasons why I'm going to be valuable and able to create success for you. So for you guys that don't have a new construction background, go find other agents in your market that do and figure out what you can do to be valuable to them, whether that means working their open houses, showing houses for them, helping them with marketing. I don't care if you have to go door knocking for them because if you're new to this industry, you've got to work hard and you've got to hustle to develop the skills and the knowledge base to be able to do this. And if you do, oh, yeah. I mean, just your top agent that you work with a lot in San Diego, what do you think their income was from your relationship over the last few years? Top agents, so they, they could acquire a place for us for 600000 It's going to have an outsell of $5.5 So, and we don't pay full commission, but we pay pretty good. Okay. <laughs> so, Way uh, to be it, honest. It's, it's going to be a solid $150,000, $200,000 upside that we've brought to the table for them. Just one, one. agent. One. And that's... You're working with people that do staging, people that, so this is something I get feedback and I've worked with a lot of agents to sell. I sell some of our stuff, but I'm not like the best sales agent. <laughs> um, You're like, not the I'm best. a really good developer. I'm not a good listing agent for my own stuff. Okay. Because I'm very attached. I'm a very good listing agent for other people's stuff, but I'm really bad for my own stuff. And okay. I'm, and I'm very aware of that. So I avoid that's it That's unique to be aware of mm -hmm. that. So that's awesome. Yeah. Because I'm like, it's worth way more. But uh, <laughs> I'm like the terrible seller at the <laughs> listing appointment with myself as the agent. <laughs> and then you're, so, you have like two, two people yeah. talking on both sides. Yeah. And, 10 million. Four. Ten million. Yeah, my and my investors are like, no, it's worth less. I'm like, no. <laughs> so but um I digress with where I was going here. Um staging. Oh yeah. yeah. So as a developer, I I pay for staging, I pay for photos, I pay for video, I pay for all that stuff because we believe in that. Yeah. But the agent has to know they need it. Because I've had agents not come to the table, come to the table and not feel like they needed that. They're like, it's new, it's in the area, it's going to sell. New houses are harder to sell up front. Yeah. They just are. They, the vision's not there yet. Unless it is super cool, but as I've described, I don't build in the super cool neighborhoods too often. <laughs> so I'm usually working with cookie cutter basic stuff and then yeah that, you that's, need it staged yeah it has to be staged yep 
So. so that's another thing, guys. Some of you are afraid to tell a developer that they need to stage because you're afraid of the money. But ultimately, your reputation is tarnished when you give them bad advice. And when you stage it, you're going to sell it faster and for more money. So that's a, that's a really good point. And it's, it's important, too. A developer versus a flipper has more real money, a more likely a, has more real money and a higher interest rate on their loan than a flipper because of the way the loans are structured. So the cost of money to them for speed is actually better. Yep. So unless you have like a new flipper who's paying like insane rates. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah, generally we have more of our own money in the deal. So you want out. We want out, yeah. Yep, that's something to be aware of. And there's another piece of this here. If you come in and try and buy the listing, and we touched on this earlier, but you tell him, hey, I think you can get $7 million, and he's telling you $7 million, and you agree with him, you're going to cost yourself the relationship if it's not $7 million. So you need to fight it out up front oh, yeah. and tell him what your opinion is. Because if you come to him two weeks later and say, okay, we're not getting any showings, now we need to reduce, he's already lost confidence in you. If you said, listen, I understand you want to get $7 million. The comps that I'm looking at seem to support five. Right. And I'm willing to work with you on the approach, but I think it's going to sell at five and I'm concerned we're not going to get traffic. Then if he decides to be bullish and go at seven, you haven't ruined the relationship because you've been honest about your feedback and showed him facts. Yeah. Right. So it's really important that you don't shy away from the truth. And a lot of agents do. Yeah. In another thing I find really useful, copy and paste all negative feedback and send it to the developer. Don't hide it. Don't keep it a secret. So definitely send it to us. Show us like what people even when really they have think. steam coming out yeah. of their ears, they Always need to hear it. it. It's not. It, I. That's the scariest thing in the world, but it helps. We actually send it directly. So we actually set it up that it's automated, that when any feedback comes in, it goes directly to the developer. And some of my developers awesome. I've been working with for like 10 years, and they get, they get so heated. Oh, yeah. Oh, because oh. it's like their identity in that house, and they work so hard, and they're like, you know what, screw them. I don't even want them to buy the house. It's like, okay, that's why you hire us, right? Yeah. So that we can bring logic to the situation and figure out how to overcome objections that are coming up. But you have to present them. Agents that are afraid to do that, then you don't know how to navigate to get to the sale. It's now the agent's fault. Yeah. It's not the properties. It's. I, <laughs> Thank it, you for it, saying that because you're right. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's so true. And I'm I will get furious when you send it to me. <laughs> Yep. But it's so true. Yeah. I, I, I've had to swallow a few hard pills, but if I had just swallowed them earlier, it would have been over. Yep. Well, and you don't want a repetitive mistake, right? So if you shelter the developer and you manage to get it so sold, and then the developer thinks that the countertops that they picked are awesome, and they do it again <laughs> for the next project after you just really worked magic to get it done, that's not serving anyone. No. At all. Um, cool. Okay. Closing thoughts, because a lot of the people who are watching are like, I want to work with developers. I want to crack this code. Any last piece of advice that you would give them? Last piece of advice would be going in and really going after that planning and really finding an area and becoming a fixture. Um, there's been a few agents in San Diego that have become fixtures in certain neighborhoods. And once you can become a fixture and you can do the development sign, which I think is the key to real estate, like advertising the three foot wide, five foot tall sign development coming soon is just awesome. Just dive in, learn an area, even if it's a five block area. Yeah. Just go in and really dissect that area, find every developer that's working in that neighborhood and just go after that with all of your energy for 12 to 24 months and it, it'll turn into something yeah it, it will it's it's just i just think that's the number one way to then start branching out from there so absolutely that's really good advice thank you so much for yeah. being here today and thank you guys for being here if you want more value like this and you want to learn how to get more business please subscribe to our podcast we're going to have more amazing stuff coming out soon thanks guys we
Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Hyper Fat Show. Subscribe to us if you want to make sure you get the latest and greatest Hyper Fat Shows. And remember, we love reviews. Reviews help us bring better and better guests and improve our shows. So give us the good, the bad, and the ugly. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you next time.